Hi, my name is Patrick Boyle. Welcome back to my YouTube channel where we learn all about derivatives and quantitative finance. If this is your first video, make sure that you click the subscribe button to see more content like this. I've just done a series of videos explaining what value at risk is, so hopefully everyone watching knows what VAR is. If not, click on the link above to watch a video on that topic. By the end of this video, you'll know all about the flaws of VAR, the common abuses of VAR, and some of the main criticisms of this method. Value at risk is a calculation designed to work out the predicted loss in a portfolio at a specific confidence level, usually 95% or 99% over a certain period of time, which is usually one day. The VAR risk measure defines risk as mark-to-market loss on a fixed portfolio over a fixed time horizon. Essentially, what it is trying to tell us is what does a normal bad day look like with a given investment portfolio. Value at risk is an attempt to measure risk and put it in the format of a single number so that financial risk can be quickly explained and understood. And as I mentioned in an earlier video, that's both its best and worst feature. The entire point of VAR is to attempt to measure risk and put it in the format of a single number so that financial risk can then be quickly explained and understood. This is particularly useful to managers of large complex financial institutions where they may not necessarily understand the specific risks been taken on various desks, but they would like to know if the overall risk level is increasing or decreasing. It's designed to give them a single number to look at so that they can then dig deeper to understand how concentrated risks might be and where and why these risks are being taken in the various departments that they oversee. While this may make sense, VAR can be easy to misunderstand and can be dangerous when misunderstood. For a senior manager, concentrating on this one number which claims to estimate the risks of rare events can give false confidence and lead to excessive risk taking and leverage at financial institutions. If senior management is to judge risk exposure by one number, this can be exploited by traders. Traders within these institutions are usually quite aware of the risk metrics that they are being judged by, and as such, VAR can create an incentive for them to take excessive but remote risks. The use of VAR when you have just experienced a very benign volatility environment in the markets can be very misleading. Losses are measured by assuming that the assets can be sold at current market prices. However, if a firm has highly illiquid assets, VAR may underestimate the true losses, since the assets may have to be sold at a huge discount in order to get out of them. In the two years following July 2007, markets experienced 20 days of 10 or greater standard deviation moves. As a reference point, a six sigma event or a six standard deviation move should occur according to normal distribution once every one and a half million years. And 10 sigma events are significantly less likely to occur than that. So for 20 of them to occur in rapid succession like that tells you that a log normal distribution is not a good description of how markets actually move. Whenever a model predicts that something has almost no chance of failure, the probability that the model can fail becomes important. Quite often that probability overshadows the predicted risk by many orders of magnitude. There are several flaws in the value at risk calculation. Firstly, VAR assumes normally distributed returns. Many assets have fat-tailed, left-skewed distributions. In these situations, VAR will greatly underestimate expected losses. Secondly, VAR assumes that a portfolio is static, which is rarely the case. Thirdly, just because 95 VAR predicts that you will have losses of X percent on 12 days of the year, that does not mean that these days will be evenly spaced. They could and often will occur sequentially. Fourthly, value at risk drastically underestimates correlations in a crisis. In market crises, when traders rush to exit positions and reduce portfolios, risk assets tend to become more correlated. 
As correlation moves closer to one, the benefits that an investor gets from diversification erode. VAR is not really very helpful at all in such situations. While VAR has many flaws and without doubt is an inaccurate measure of market risk, it can be argued that it is useful to people who understand it and its flaws. Senior management who are fed too much detailed information about individual positions and trades might find themselves unable to process that much data. But if instead they are shown a consistent risk report, they can compare today's risk to yesterday's risk levels to last week's and last year's data and see where in the business market risk is growing or shrinking. They can then dig a bit deeper, ask the right questions and understand the dynamics of the market risk that their company is exposed to. Usually a risk report does not just show VAR numbers and it's just one of the many calculations that a risk manager will prepare. Okay, so next let's talk about some of the most common abuses of VAR. Common abuses in dealing with the value at risk calculation are, number one, thinking of VAR as the worst case loss. As I've explained earlier, VAR is just a threshold and it tells you that you are in one of the worst X percent days, but it doesn't tell you how bad it can get and it certainly doesn't cap the size of the losses. I often hear people who have years of experience in finance making this mistake, so hopefully uh, my students and the people who watch my videos won't make that kind of mistake. Now number two, the second mistake that people make, if they're smart enough to not make the first mistake, you'll sometimes hear people saying that losses will be some multiple, often three of VAR. So they'll say, well no, VAR is not the worst loss you can take, but maybe three times VAR is the worst. Once again, that is not true. VAR does not measure uh, how deep into the tail you can go. It simply tells you that you are in the tail, that you're in that scenario. Number three, making VAR reduction the central concern of risk management. Now this happens a lot with junior risk managers who don't really understand that their role is to manage risk and to encourage sensible risk taking within an organization. Now if you just look at a spreadsheet and read a VAR number out and go around asking people to reduce their VAR, you might be just doing counterproductive work. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of traders may end up just taking the kind of positions that actually have a type of risk that just doesn't show up in your VAR calculation. So a risk manager's job is to understand the risk and to make sure that a reasonable level of risk is been taken in pursuit of profit. In next week's video we're going to talk about expected shortfall, stress testing and we'll wrap up this whole section on VAR. All of these videos, by the way, are based on my book, Trading and Pricing Financial Derivatives, which is available on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the description below. Hit the like button to let me know you found this video helpful and hit the subscribe button and the bell button next to it in order to see more videos like this in your feed. Have a great day. Bye.